thoughts and conclusions. It could be argued that the first symbol I translated was nothing more than a case of coincidence or pareidolia. But with each subsequent translation that correlates with a previous translation, the chance of this being coincidence is reduced greatly, and I have translated 58 symbols that all correlate. The odds of this translation being inaccurate are extremely slim, and thus the probability that the authors were mining uranium is high. The Giza Pyramid Complex The American researcher Jeffrey Drum has an excellent theory about how the Great Pyramid of Giza could be used to produce vast amounts of a watery, sulfuric acid solution. This may seem like a random conclusion for someone to come to, but it is in fact exactly what was needed, being produced in the exact spot where it would be used. Beneath the Great Pyramid, there's a subterranean chamber that's been excavated into the bedrock. The chamber contains a well shaft that's connected to an underground aquifer. In today's nuclear industry, the majority of our uranium is recovered from in and around these underground waterways using a process called in situ leach mining. In situ leach mining is a process that uses two or more boreholes to remove uranium from the ground. Firstly, some of the native groundwater is removed, and then an oxidizer which is normally sulfuric acid, is added to it. The watery sulfuric acid solution is then re-injected into the ground, close to or upstream from the uranium. As the solution migrates downstream, towards the extraction well, the uranium particles that are stuck to the sand and rocks are dissolved into the solution. When the laden solution reaches the extraction shaft, it's pumped up to the surface or to a subsurface processing station where the separation and refinement processes begin. I suspect the well shaft in the Great Pyramid subterranean chamber was used as an injection well. It's possible that the well shaft to the west of the Sphinx enclosure was also used as a second injection well. The topography is such that any spillage of the acidic solution in this area would migrate over the western wall of the Sphinx enclosure and come into contact with the rump of the Sphinx. Because of this, consideration should be given to this being the cause of the much debated advanced erosion in these areas. The Osiris Shaft is a well shaft complex located beneath the causeway of Khafre's Pyramid. I believe this is the most likely site for an extraction well. I recall hearing that when they first excavated the shaft that they had trouble pumping all the water out of it, it was apparently filling up just as fast as they could empty it. They had to wait for the ground water levels to drop naturally before they were able to temporarily drain it. This tells me that this is a place where groundwater naturally migrates to, which makes it the perfect place for an extraction well because the pumps would be working with the natural flow of the water. So to recap, I think the injection sites are beneath the Great Pyramid and possibly the well shaft to the west of the Sphinx, and I think the extraction site was the Osiris shaft under the causeway of Khafre's pyramid. It... This method of uranium mining is the most popular because it's the most cost-effective and causes the least amount of surface disturbance. The compartmentalized design of the industry is the reason for its cost-effectiveness and versatility. Using this method, many satellite mines can make use of a single centralized processing plant. This reduces the outlay needed for new mines, thus making much smaller ore deposits economically viable for recovery. For these reasons, consideration should be given to the possibility 
that other ancient sites beyond the Giza necropolis were also being leached of uranium. The Serapium, the Serapium of Saqqara, is located 24 kilometers south of Cairo. The site comprises a series of subterranean tunnels which have caverns excavated into the walls. 22 of these caverns contain stone boxes complete with tight-fitting lids. The boxes have an average size of 2 meters high, 2 meters wide, and 3.85 meters long. They're estimated to weigh between 40 and 100 tons with their lids. Most of the boxes are made from granite, with some made from diorite and basalt. The depth and layout of the site are such that it would be perfect for a below-ground, near-surface disposal facility, as is defined by the IAEA. In 2021, a study was published on the American government website titled Nuclear Radiation Shielding Characteristics of Some Natural Rocks by Using EPICS 2017 Library. The rocks they tested were olivine basalt, jet black granite, limestone, sandstone, and dolerite. In the final part of their conclusion, they wrote this. The radiation shielding characteristics of the studied rocks are found to be better than those of various traditional concretes and very close to those of commercial glasses. Therefore, the natural rocks can be used as superior economic and environmentally friendly shields for radiation shielding applications. This means that according to our latest scientific knowledge, if we had some low-level or short-lived intermediate-level waste to dispose of, then a site identical to the Serapium would be perfect. And as for what we'd use as containers, then the stone boxes found in the caverns are also perfect. The Great Pyramid of Giza the builders would have known that they would eventually recover all the uranium from this site, at which point they'd face two challenges. First, what to do with the structure itself. And second, what to do with the low-level waste this process produced. Makes perfect sense that once they'd finished with the structure, they'd use it as an above-ground near-surface disposal facility to store some of the waste they'd accumulated as we know, the Great Pyramid was looted and emptied sometime before we discovered it in the Common Era. As such, we can only guess what might have been sealed inside by those who built, then abandoned it. But not everything is gone, there's several hidden chambers that would be perfect as storage areas for solidified waste. Most of these areas have been accessed and emptied. In some cases, the excavators report that these voids or chambers were filled with sand. There's one chamber that remains and possibly contains remnants of some ancient solidified low-level waste and that's the concealed chamber beneath the Queen's chamber. Its layout is thought to resemble a passageway with niches or rooms going off it. The corridor is thought to be around 30 meters long and about one meter high. It was discovered in 1985 by French architects Gilles Dormion and Jean-Patrice Guadin. In 1986, they were given permission to drill holes into the concealed chamber, and when they did, sand spilt out. And the sand wasn't regular desert sand, rather, it was quartz sand, and it's said to be of a small and uniform grain size. It's thought that the corridor and niches were utilized as some kind of storeroom which was backfilled with sand and sealed shut when it was no longer needed. I agree with this, except I think it was low-level radioactive waste being stored there. The layout of the passageway with its niches is the perfect design for such a use. The end niche could be used first, 
and then filled in. Coincidentally, when our scientists are faced with this challenge today, the preferred backfilling substrate for radioactive waste, sites like this, is quartz sand, exactly what was found sealed in here. Another possibility is that the quartz sand itself may be the waste rather than or as well as the backfilling substrate. Quartz sand can be produced artificially using quartz dust and resin. Quartz was known to be popular in ancient Egypt and quartz dust produced from the mining and working of quartz is highly toxic. It's possible that the liquid low-level waste from the uranium mining operation was processed reduced in volume and combined with spent ion exchange resin and quartz dust to solidify it into engineered quartz sand. This would be combining two toxic waste streams into one useful product that could go on to serve as a backfilling substrate or as part of a concrete mixture where a degree of shielding is required. An artistic impression of what the Great Pyramid looked like. The tight-fitting and highly polished casing stones would have provided the impermeable membrane. The King's chamber air shafts would be used as gas vents and liquid drainage is available through the subterranean chamber, all in line with the IAEA description of a ground level near surface disposal facility. the Osiris Shaft Complex. As I've mentioned, the Osiris Shaft Complex is where I suspect the extraction pump was located. The Shaft Complex has three levels. On the second level, there's a cavern with six niches carved into the walls. Two of those niches contain large stone boxes made out of basalt, again this site, and its stone boxes are ideal for use as a below ground near surface disposal facility. Some types of nuclear waste have to be stored underwater until it has sufficiently cooled before it can be moved to dry cask storage. At the base of the Osiris shaft there's a large stone box with a tight-fitting lid submerged beneath the water. The reason this was deemed a good spot for an extraction shaft was that this is a place where groundwater naturally migrates to and would be amongst the last areas to dry up. This makes it a good site for cooling waste before it's transferred to a dry cask storage area. It makes sense that once they decommissioned the mine, that they'd utilize the Osiris shaft as a waste treatment and storage facility. In today's mining industry, it's common for toxic tailings to be stored next to the mine and then be put back into the mine once it's been fully exploited. Having a disposal facility in the extraction shaft complex is in keeping with that philosophy. Ion exchange materials and the black goo. Ion exchange materials are usually either polymers or resins and are widely used throughout nuclear and chemical industries to aid with various purification and separation processes. For example, during the in-situ uranium leach mining process, the uranium-laden solution that's extracted from the mine is passed through beads made from ion exchange materials. Uh, the uranium in the solution sticks to the beads, the beads are then processed, and the uranium is separated from the beads. Ion exchange materials can be reused but eventually they have to be replaced. Spent ion exchange materials are another form of hazardous nuclear waste and have to be processed and stored as such. One of the ways we do this today is by immobilizing the processed waste materials in a bitumen mixture. Many of the large stone boxes in the near surface disposal facilities at the Serapium and in the Osiris shaft contained a black goo. It's also been found in many mummy cases. The goo was analysed by the British Museum. The exact composition varied from one box to the next, but the goo was found to comprise plant oil, animal fat, 
tree resin, beeswax, and bitumen. All of the ingredients, with the exception of bitumen, can be used as organic ion exchange materials, and bitumen can be used to immobilize spent ion exchange materials. This black goo is exactly what 4,000-year-old spent, processed, and bituminized ion exchange materials would look like, and they were found inside stone boxes that were perfect for storing radioactive waste at sites that are perfect for use as radioactive waste sites. Mummification. So it seems that ancient Egyptians started mining uranium and mummifying their dead at around the same time. In 1986, the first responders who attended the Chernobyl disaster became so saturated with radiation that their bodies had to be welded into lead coffins. It's unlikely that the ancient Egyptians developed a perfect understanding of atomic energy without making at least one mistake, and any mistake has the potential to be cataclysmic and would take a long time to clean up. There's also the question of the workers and how they must have been exposed to radiation. The mummification methods that the ancient Egyptians used is also an effective waste immobilization technique similar to bituminization. First, the stomach, intestines, lungs and liver were all removed dried out and placed into separate jars. This practice is akin to a practice we use to store contaminated waste called dry cask storage. And then the bodies were encapsulated with alternating layers of resin and linen. And then in some cases they were cemented into their coffins with several litres of black goo. For these reasons, we should keep an open mind as to the true motivation behind the mummification process. This brings us to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed listening to these ideas. Thank you and goodbye.